Hey guys, JB here from Alpha Wolf Consulting. Coming to you today with another episode of Understanding Thyself. Um, and this is a fun episode because I'm going to be talking around how I cultivated and created the authentic me. So my, my version of my authentic self. And basically what we're going to do today is I'm going to talk through and sort of align the, the last episodes of the series in terms of cultivating your authentic self or, or for me cultivating my authentic self has been basically the understanding of you know, self-validation, you know, self-belief, self-confidence, self-worth, understanding language and narratives, understanding state management and, you know, my emotional states and my biochemical responses, understanding my conscious and subconscious mind. So my goal is to essentially tie all these topics together to sort of show you how we layer the like these aspects of me or I layer these aspects of me to sort of create that holistic version of me of who I want to be and it's you know for me this is the revolution of life because for my entire life, I was led to believe that I had to try and be someone else, you know, to, to sort of, I had to create this identity and become this identity. And, and sort of what my teachings are about is sort of understanding how to push that to the side, that idea of being someone else and really exploring who am I and what makes me unique to myself because that's what I've realized in life is my own personal liberation came from when I started rejecting all these external beliefs in terms of who I have to be, who I should be. And, you know, where I'm at personally now in my personal development journey, in my life journey, is someone who authentically feels amazing being myself, even if everyone hates me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what other people think of me. Other people can think whatever they want of me. I don't care. I enjoy me. So that's my goal is to sort of share this understanding that I've, you know, had to go out and forge and create for myself to really help others, you know, see the light that I've seen in life, which was once I started actually being who I wanted to be authentically and unapologetically I started to feel excited and happy again about life I started to, to feel confident being who I am you know I felt worth and who I was and yeah to me it's the it's the greatest personal liberation I've ever felt because I don't need to become anyone to be the best version of myself. So we'll sort of start with understanding like self-validation in terms of my understandings on self-validation is that I have to be able to validate my thoughts and beliefs as being valuable to me before, you know, 
Other, otherwise, if I don't think the thoughts and the beliefs that I hold are valuable, then I'll never feel good about myself. I'll never feel confident about who I am. You know, I can never have self-belief because I'll always be comparing and doubting and looking at what other people do. So, you know, the realizations I've had around self-validation have been that it is my responsibility to validate my values within myself, my thoughts of what I think is right and wrong and what I think is correct in life, what I, you know, in any aspect of life. So this, this transfers across personal, professional, relationships, like, <coughs> What woman would ever want to be with me if I don't value who I am? And that's a funny thing because I always, in my earlier days in relationships, I always tried to emulate people or characters that I saw in the movies. You know what I mean? And it's it's so funny because for me, you know, while I had success, I, it never felt good to me. I was always being someone that I didn't want to be. I was always, you know, hiding my values in, in search of, you know, getting other people to value me. And it's so funny because, you know, the more I've learned understood about it, um, basically, the more I've come to realise how I was um, basically turning people off who I was by not being confident as myself. And, and that's really, really funny to me because I thought it was the other way around. So I thought by appeasing other people and by, you know, valuing what they thought above or what they wanted in life above what I wanted in life, what happened was is I thought that was how you got people to like you. And I, it wasn't until I sort of reached that point in my life where I got sick of being someone that I wasn't, that I that I sort of found the courage, or not really the courage, like it's not courageous to be yourself, it's sort of like I just couldn't stand being someone else, like I had to get to a point in life where to me... Like, it was sort of like being someone else. I sort of didn't want to, you know, live anymore. Like, I was, I was not severely depressed, but I was very depressed. Because, like, it, it just, it always felt like I would have to be the version of me I thought people wanted to see. You know, to succeed and, you know, attract people I wanted to in my life. But what I couldn't see in those days was the only people I was attracting were the people who wanted to be around that, that false character that I had created. And unfortunately for me, this was a very self-destructive way of living because the person I created was the opposite of me. So in essence, what I was doing was attracting people who didn't like the authentic me and then I was sort of forcing myself to be who they wanted me to be to really, you know, 
right? Become accepted among other people. And it's just like, at this point and stage in my life, I would sooner kill myself than not be my authentic self. Like, I cannot stand being another person anymore. And it's so funny because in my professional life, you know, working in sales, it's all about sort of wearing masks, you know, creating this persona of, you know, if I'm a property consultant, you know, I'm the persona of what people think or assume a property consultant should look like <coughs> or how they should act. And it's, it's so funny because, you know, work-wise, I was, you know, I was lucky in my life that I found some really amazing people and great bosses and companies to work for, and I was very lucky, but I always was highly strung and highly anxious because I didn't know who they wanted me to be. So I never felt confident unless I was playing the role of who I thought they that I should be, you know? And, you know, for me personally, I just, I, I got to a point in my professional career where I just couldn't do it anymore. You know, many men and women will resonate with this if you've gone through a midlife crisis. Essentially, I'm very lucky in life that, like, I put so much focus and effort onto, like, knowing, like, like living my best life that I addressed a lot of the issues that the majority of people wait until they're 40 or 50 before they worry about it, like accepting death. At the age of 18, I decided I had to understand death, and I had to understand what happens when we die and all of this, and, you know, because I didn't want to wait until I was 60 to explore the topic. Because I didn't want to waste my whole life, you know, and then sort of just at the age of 60, realise that I was living a life that I didn't want to live, that scared the hell out of me, you know. So, I, I forced myself to face the things that scared me in life, in terms of like, my biggest fear in life was waking up when I was 80 and realizing I had never lived my life. You know, I'd always lived this, you know, like shell of an existence and I couldn't stand that. But like, because I, I you know, lived for so long as this, you know, mask of who I was as this fake person, it just, yeah, I, I, I got to the point where I realised that that was what was making me miserable in life, was that I was afraid to be who I was and who I wanted to be because I feared criticism, I feared judgement, I feared other people not accepting me for who I wanted to be. And what I've realized through exploring self-validation was like that was the epitome of my hell, was living as someone else because I was afraid to be who I wanted to be in fear of other people not accepting me. But by living that way, 
I was the only one when I was living as someone else that wasn't accepting who I was. And like so many people I know in life have just naturally always, you know, felt confident being who they are. But a lot of people don't. A lot of people I see still live with those masks with those ideologies that you have to be someone else, that you can't show people the authentic you. And it's sort of like, it just, it just it made me so depressed on the inside because like, I never realized how much damage I was doing to myself not accepting myself. Like, I was creating so much, not hatred, but like self-hatred. Like, I, 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 I didn't accept who I was. And I, I seeked validation from other people so I valued other people's, um, like their idea of me above me. And, you know, like thinking back to it now, it's so hard to sort of describe because for me, that is, that is nowhere near who I am anymore. Like, it's sort of like seeing an old, weaker version of myself, you know? Someone that, that wasn't able to, to live and accept themselves for who they were. And that's sort of one of my personal goals with creating personal development content is that at an early age like I struggled living in my own skin you know what I mean like I struggled being myself but like for me God was always there talking to me and when I was 16, I made God a promise that if he could give me the strength to become who I wanted to be in life, I would dedicate my life to helping other people by showing them that strength. And that's sort of one of my life missions is, is to show that to people so that people can become confident being themselves and, and, and realize that even if every other human being on this planet hates you, at least God loves you. If you love yourself, at least there's one person who loves you. It doesn't matter, you know, how many people value you in life. If you value yourself, that is enough. If you love yourself, you need no love from another. And that's the thing. I didn't love myself when I was younger. I, I always, from my upbringing, was led to believe that who I was wasn't good enough unless I conformed to everyone around me. Unless I blended in. And that's sort of one of my goals in life is to break that belief so that others can see the lies of society when it comes to, like, it doesn't matter who you are in life, like, just by you being alive, like, you're valuable. Like, everyone has value, it doesn't matter. You can have Down syndrome and be mentally handicapped, and you are still a highly valuable person. Like, like 
you know, the funny thing is, especially with like, if you take Down syndrome people, they are the happiest people in life. Like, I'm not saying they live a happy life, but they're joyous, you know? They, you know, they enjoy the smallest things in life, you know? And you can't not be happy when you see someone with Down syndrome because typically they can be doing the most mundane task and they do it with this enthusiasm and vibrancy that is inspiring, like, you know? And it's so funny because so many people in society look down on them as if they're disabled just because they're not of the same mental stature as as others you know and like for me personally i was i was told every day of my childhood that i was stupid and that i had severe learning disabilities and that i would be nothing but a janitor that is what every adult told me in school that I would be nothing in life. And for, you know, and I was always, half of me believed them, and then the other half of me said, I don't care what you say, I know the value I hold. But it was this internal battle that it kicked off. And it's, it's so disappointing when I look back on my childhood at how ignorant and weak these adults were that I put my trust and faith in, that I believed and listened to. And it's sort of, you know, knowing what I know now, like, yeah, it's, it's so funny. So if you ever want to know something about kids, okay, regardless of how they behave and act, if you want them to become their best, you need to condition in positive reinforcement for the behaviours that you want, not condition in negative reinforcement for the behaviours you don't want. Because all that does is if you only ever reinforce the negative behaviors you don't want me to do that is all I focus on and it's so so funny because you know coming into the next area self-belief like growing up like as, as a young adult I was so high strung anxious all the time because I never had cultivated self-belief in myself even though you know I, I put in 180% effort until I mastered anything I did I never felt good about myself for the, the skills and the abilities that I had learned through life because I had never had anyone sort of build that, that belief within me. And it's, it's so funny because, you know, teaching myself when I was between the ages of 16 and 24, self-belief, well, society led me to believe that self-belief was rooted in your ego of how great you are of how amazing you are so like I focused on my ego and building my ego which led me to become like for example like you know the only male role model I had pretty much growing up was my grandfather who was highly egotistical and highly narcissistic. So that's, you know, how I thought you had to be to be a man, was it, if someone said something wrong, you berate them for being stupid. 
you belittle people to show them how much better than you than them you are and all of this like so I had this as sort of like as David Goggins says a cracked foundation to the point where I believed that to build self-confidence I had to root my self-confidence in my ego and in narcissistic tendencies which led me to become a highly toxic and negative person that was so insecure that you know to to show like for you to point out my insecurities I would become highly aggressive and threaten violence because that was the learned you know the learned way of dealing with things and it's you know for me like I'm grateful that I had to learn the hard way and I had to learn the wrong way before I could realize the right way to do it. Like, so many people, in, you know, in their childhoods and growing up, are given this amazing foundation where, you know, their, their parents build them up to understanding the right ways like I would never change my childhood because like learning the wrong way and, and realizing that it was wrong forced me to have to go out there and figure it out for myself. So like I learned how to, you know, work through it and do it on myself. So it gave me so many skills and abilities and ways of analyzing and observing myself and seeing myself, which really set me up for the later years in life. But it just meant I went through a lot of self-suffering in the earlier years. So like, for example, you know, whenever I would try and do something or I would tell people my ideas like people always told me I was stupid throughout my whole life because how I think is different to how other people think how I approach and problem solve is different to how other people approach and problem solve so like I'm always going against the grain and you know like being attacked so much for who I was forced me to really you know be able to stand my ground and hold my ground but it also taught me that nothing could beat me down like nothing could sort of break me in because I was given throughout life all the opportunities to quit but unfortunately you know when God made me he made me with that without the understanding of pain or, or quitting like I don't understand how to give up there is only ever forward to me like I'll tell you a funny story of when I tried to impress a girl when I was in university in my early 20s, we went out on a date, sort of wakeboarding at a cable park. And now I, I had never wakeboarded before, but I had, you know, skated and things like that. And the guys at the cable park told me like, hey, it's like a skateboard. So stand on it like you stand on a skateboard. But the thing was, is I used to ride on one of the trick skateboards. So how I used to skate around to stop myself from rocks hitting me and stuff is I would always have all my weight on the front foot and I'd have my, my back foot ready to pop up the front whenever needed. So if you can imagine trying to, on a cable, 
table get the take off for the wakeboard, I was going front foot heavy. All my weight was on the front foot. So every time I went to take off, within seconds, I would face plant into the ground. Well, not the ground, but the water. And the thing was, is I don't feel embarrassment. So like for me, you know, I didn't feel like, oh, I suck at this, I'm so terrible and all of this. No, I just didn't understand it. So it didn't make sense to me. So literally it took me 18 attempts of falling flat on my face before someone, one of the guys pulled me aside and explained you have to put your, your weight on your back foot. And the funny thing was, as soon as he did that and told me how to do it, the next run I had it. That's the funny thing. Like, you know, I'm trying to impress this girl who was, you know, very sporty. So, you know, she was kicking ass on there and doing well. And I'm there like a noob, just eating shit and face plant. But like, I didn't feel ashamed of myself. I just, like I'd realized I suck at this. You know what I mean? But like, I don't understand. Like, it doesn't make sense for me to quit because like, for me, I've, I've realized throughout life that like succeeding in anything is, is just on the other side of understanding what I need to do to succeed. So it's like, that's a funny thing, is that like, I've always failed at everything I've done, but the reason I become so good at anything is because I can just fail more, like more times in a shorter period of time, like, you know, I can just keep going up there again and again and again and falling square on my face. And like, it just becomes an obsession to understand. Because like, you know, I'm not like every, like throughout my life when I've tried to impress people, I fail at everything. So if I, if I did things to impress people, I always knew I was gonna fail because I was doing something that I had never done before. So I had no past experience or any past understanding to lean back on to. So it's sort of like, for me, I've always liked learning on my own in private because it allows me to really observe and understand and, and do it at my own pace. But the funny thing is, once I understand, then I become obsessed. So like, it's just one of those things that, like to a degree, I've always had this internal self-belief, but I never valued it because other people didn't value it. Other people laughed at me, you know, like, Eating, eating shit and going face down, trying to take off on a wakeboard 18 times in a row. Like people were looking at me like I should be ashamed of myself. Like they were embarrassed for me. And like I didn't really notice because like, like yeah, of course I suck. I've never done this before. Like it would be egotistical for me to think that I would be amazing at it straight away. But the funny thing was, as soon as I had that understanding, you can't take that away from me. You know what I mean? So like, throughout my working career, I've had about you know 60 or 70 different jobs because I like the process of learning. I like that uncomfortable feeling of eating shit and failing. Like, the, the harder and the more I fail in a shorter period of time, the more drive I get to understand it. Like every time you punch me in the face, I come back with more energy.
like, that's the funny thing. Like, you know, like, so, and, and really, I have no concept of pain. Like, I feel pain and it hurts, but I don't understand how it hurts in comparison to other people. So I always assume the worst pain I feel like is nothing. Like I assume other people have gone through more pain. And there's there's many reasons for that. You know, when preparing for the military, you've got to sort of prepare yourself to in combat you might have a limb blown off. You you will more than likely be shot. Like you're gonna be in extreme pain. So like for example, you if I'm, you know, battered and bruised, well, it's not really that bad, you know? Like, people get the absolute shit beaten out of them, you know, with bats in life. Like, what I'm feeling isn't anything in comparison to that. Like, people cut off their arms, have cut off their arms, their hands, they have their arms ripped off, they have their limbs ripped off. Like, the, the insignificant pain that I'm feeling in the moment isn't really that bad. Like, I'm always comparing, pretty much, I compare anything that I do to death. Like, death is essentially the ultimate failure because there's no coming back from death in the context of once I die, I die. So it's sort of like, that's always been what I compare everything to. So like, for example, if I feel embarrassed about how much I suck at something, yeah, but I'm not dead, I'm still alive. So like, regardless of what happens, like, nothing has gone wrong. You know what I mean? Like, it's not that bad, this emotional feeling that I'm feeling. But because I was always seeking other people's validation, unless other people told me how good I was, I didn't believe it. And I wouldn't believe it if one person told me I was good at something. It had to be multiple people telling me and, and what they said about me had to sort of be similar until I would believe it as being true. And, you know, which is, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's sort of like, it's so self-limiting because unless I had people telling me that I was good at something, I never felt good at it. So unless my boss, you know, would be telling me how amazing of a worker I was, like, I always felt like I was doing a shit job. Which wasn't good for my psyche because it left me highly strung and highly anxious because I was always scared that they were going to fire me. So I would work twice as hard as everyone around me to sort of, so that I could feel comfortable, because I knew that, you know, I'd, I'd made up these rules that if, if I can do two to three times the amount of work as the next person, like, the likelihood that I, I am the least valuable person on the team it is so low. So it's sort of like, but what that required was an inhuman amount of effort. So like, like all these negative sort of things in my life gave me so many positive benefits that I am so grateful for it. Like I'm grateful that I had to struggle, you know, for the first 50, oh, like 30 years of my life being codependent and validating myself through everyone else and having no internal self-belief because it forced me to create these mottos. Like, for example, my motto is don't give 100%, give 180%. So literally, 
however fast someone else does it, like you've got to push yourself to do twice as much work as them in the same period of time. So when I was like, for example, a bricklayer, all the, the tradies I worked for loved me because when I was moving bricks, like I would be physically running with 20 bricks in each hand at 16. You know what I mean? Because like I believed everything they said to me when so when they said to me that you you have to be able to run with 20 bricks in each hand, like I thought that was just the standard. So like that was just how much I like like what I had to do. Like, you know what I mean? And being that I have like a like a high ADHD, like I have the energy reserves to be able to run for eight hours straight. Like, I don't get exhausted or tired. Like, I, I constantly push myself to where, on average, I hike 20 kilometers a day. You know what I mean? Like, I walk 20 kilometers every day. The, the sort of, the longest distance I, I will, typically go in any day that I've done is between 45 and 50 kilometers do you, do you sort of do you sort of know what I mean like but that was only because my knee started to seize the muscles and the tendons that I sort of decided that you know I'm gonna call it a day but if required I could quite easily walk a hundred kilometers like don't get me wrong like by the by the end of it like I am not going to be having a good time I'm going to be in extreme pain but like the only way is forward like I only know forward like I would never like give up and just sit down and, and stop like if I have to walk a hundred kilometers to get home that's what I'm gonna do like that's my only option like so you know it's sort of so so funny in that in that context because because I I don't really like the way I look at it is I'm, I'm sort of stupid in a sense that like, giving up just doesn't really make sense to me. Like, I don't understand because, like, logically, if I keep walking, even if my feet are bloody and every step is agonizing, like, I will get, get there in the end. Like, like, nothing is going to stop me from getting there. Do you sort of, does it make sense? So like, yeah, like that's just the thing. I just, like the other thoughts don't come in. It's just forward. And that's one of the things I've realized as I've been able to sort of work on building, you know, self-belief within myself is that like all these things that I used to think of as, as weaknesses of being stupid, you know, of being stubborn, like only seeing one path to my destination just means that once I consciously understand that once I choose a path that I'm going to travel like it just doesn't make sense to try and find shortcuts like if I already know the route that I want to travel well I may as well just stay on that path even if it's the most difficult path it's okay like, you know what I mean? So, like, as I've sort of developed and, and learned how to validate my thoughts and beliefs and values, and then I've learned how to, you know, cultivate self-belief, which is just literally sort of like I'm explaining, like, self-belief is just that internal narrative that 
when you get that thought to quit or to give up, it's just like you got to say to yourself, but if I keep going forward, like I will get there. Like sort of quitting doesn't really make sense. And that's one of the funny things because I found it so hard when I would try and do things to, to have self-belief when I was trying to do things on my own because I never really, like, I never really was confident that, you know, the direction that I had picked was the right way. So I was always doubting myself by comparing myself to other people. And that's the funny thing that, you know, self-validation and self-belief teach us is we need to look internal and say, no, you know, I've done my research. This is the right path for me. This is where I want to get to. This is where I want to go. And it's sort of like, this is the path I want to travel. And then it's just that, that, that narrative or that conversation that just reinforces it and that just reminds ourselves of all the things that we've achieved and done in our life. So, for example, like, if I get a flat tire and it's 20 kilometres to the next town, like, I consciously know that I can walk about 40 to 50 k's in one day, like, like in one go, before I sort of, sort of start to get severe pain. So it's like, if it's 20 kilometres, like, that's quite easy for me to achieve. And that's the funny thing about self-belief. Is self-belief comes from our experiential knowledge of past experiences and then also the narratives we decide and choose to reinforce. So for example, you know, when starting a business, let's say you start a business and you're a builder but you've never been a builder before, you've only been a chippy, it's sort of like you figured out how to become a chippy from nothing. Like, you can figure out how to become a builder from a chippy. Like, it's all right. It's just that, that war on the inside, that, that battle in your mind that you're fighting of looking at other people and feeling inferior to them feeling like oh I couldn't do that oh I'm not good enough oh wh what I think isn't that valuable and that's one of the things we have to fight through to become our authentic self because we have to become confident in who we are and the value that we hold <coughs> you know because how can I ever you know be who I want to be if I don't think that that person is valuable, if I'm not confident that I can be that person. So for so much of my life, I acted lower than I knew I could. I limited myself, you know. I didn't take on as much responsibility as I knew I could bear. Because it was easier for me to sort of, you know, do what I already know rather than try and forge my path in the unknown. And, you know, in life, you know, being an entrepreneur, like that is the wrong way to think because to become an entrepreneur we have to recondition our mind to become okay like living in the unknown for becoming self-reliant relying on ourself it's sort of like if you're let's take a you know any any trade let's take a chippy for example like, if you're a chippy who, who is a, you know, qualified chippy, which is just a carpenter, like, if you're a chippy, 
and you work for a builder or, or a big building mob, like one of the big companies, it's sort of like, you know what I mean? Like, it's so easy to do that, even though it sucks like hell and you get ripped off, but it's like, like, there's a path, like you know what you have to do, you, you, you only have to worry about this, you've got the resources of, you know, the other blokes that work for that company, you know, the company supplies, for example, like, let's say materials and stuff like that, like, the company has all the relationships, they do all the, you know, licensing, they do all, for example, you know, insurance and stuff like that, apart from your personal one, but it's like, you know what I mean, but if you were to go out on your own, like, you can figure it out, like, other people have figured it out, like, you have that ability, and that's sort of the battle, is knowing the no and accepting to choose to be in the unknown, to be where scares you, to be where stresses you, to be where sort of like forces you to expand and become comfortable, you know, in discomfort. And, you know, for me, this was a very hard thing because like, you know, in my own, going from working for other businesses to working for myself, what I realized is, like, I didn't want to have to do the shit I had to do working for someone else for myself. Like, I didn't want to create a, a business for example, like I, I am in sales and marketing and, you know, education and personal development and stuff like that. Like my goal is to sell through content, it is to spread ideas, it is to share knowledge. Like I don't want to have to sell a freaking product. Like to me, like why would I not just go and work for someone else if I wanted to do what they were doing. Like, I don't want that. I don't want to create a business so that I have a job. I want to monetize who I am. I want to monetize my life so that I can live my life and earn a wage while living my life so that I don't have to work in life. Does it sort of make sense? Like, and that's the thing. Like, yeah, compared to other people who are business owners, like, I suck at business because I am not going to sit there and try and convince people on why I am valuable. Fuck that. No. Like, that is why I started a business, because I refuse to have to justify to people why I am someone worth listening to. No, I refuse to do that. I refuse to sit there and have to convince people of who I am. No, like not happening. I refuse, like flat out refuse. I spent years doing that for other people. You know, like having wankers treat me like shit because I was trying to help them. Like, no thank you. I started my own business so that if someone treats me like a wanker, I can turn around to them and say, go fuck yourself. I don't care about your money. You cannot buy me. And that's the funny thing. So it's like, yeah, I have to take some sacrifices in the short term to achieve what I want in the long term. But it's like, if I have to sacrifice money and short term gain and fame and recognition to be able to create what I want in life and 
be able to live the rest of my life doing what I want in life, I am 100% happy to go a couple of days without food every week. I don't mind. It doesn't bother me. Like, not saying I go without food. Like, I do a lot of fasting and stuff like that. But it's like... Like, I don't mind struggling to live how I want to live. Like, the realisation I had in life is if I want what I define as freedom, the freedom to be authentically me, yeah, I'm going to sacrifice... I have to sacrifice comfort. And that's okay. I don't mind sacrificing comfort to live authentically every day as myself and to anyone who ever, you know, tries to force me to be someone else, I can just tell them to go fuck themselves. I don't care. What can they do to me? What can anyone do to me when I love me? When I value me? When I care about me? And that's one of the funny things, is sort of the more we are unwilling to accept what we don't want in life, the closer we get to what we want in life, you know? And it's so funny, because in comparison to other people, I do... Like, it takes me thousands of actions to do what takes them 20 actions. But it's because I'm looking, you know, two to five years ahead. So I'm willing to do two to five years of work in a short period of time so that I can relax. I don't mind. I don't mind that for me to learn something takes 10,000 hours for me to understand anything. Like, I don't mind putting in that effort because I know the reward once that effort is put in, I have it forever. Like, that's the thing. Like, throughout school, throughout my life, like, the only thing I understood was to move forward with maximum effort and attention. Like, you know, like, learning how to cook when I was doing chefing, like, yeah, I sucked for so long. And I sat there for 12 hours a day figuring it out, you know? Other people can learn in shorter times, but they don't learn as as deeply as I do because they don't put in the level of effort that sort of I put in. You know what I mean? Not saying that everyone doesn't, but, you know, to the majority of people thinking about putting 10,000 hours of effort into something in 12 months, oh, well, maybe not 12 months, but in like two to three years, doesn't really seem feasible. But for me, because I like to learn privately, like, Anything that I'm doing, for example, take YouTube, take educating and, and, you know, this public speaking. I've been studying for the past five to ten years to be able to do this. I did all my work in secret. So when I start doing it, like, I've got, like, I'm not starting from zero. It's just for five, you know, take for example YouTube, the last five years I have been obsessively watching people on YouTube, all different types of content creators, watching them, sort of observing what are they doing, how are they doing it, how do people respond to it, how are they building audiences and things like that, for years, so that when I wanted to do it, I didn't have to learn as I was going along because, like, you know, throughout my childhood, I was ridiculed and made fun of because for me, learning is a very messy process. 
because it takes me so long to understand. It takes me thousands of hours of listening to the same thing again and again. For example, I wanted to understand spirituality. Okay, I wanted to understand like what spirituality meant. Like how do you feel spiritual inside? So for example, from I think it was 2020 to 2022, I only, for 18 hours a day, listened to Sadhguru. Like, I'm not lying. 18 hours a day. From the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed, I only listened to Sadhguru. I didn't watch TV. I didn't listen to any other type of content. I didn't sit on Facebook or anything like that. Like, I literally just had, you know, on Audible, I just had speeches of Sadhguru speaking, running. I listened to his books again and again and again. Like, but the thing was, because I dedicated so much devoted time to only listening to him, I I have this uncanny understanding, not, not to the same extent that he understands spirituality, but at a lower level. So it's like, I understand when he speaks of spirituality, what he means. Because the funny thing is, when, especially when I'm learning from people or studying people, like, it's not that I'm looking to learn from them, it's that I'm trying to understand their perspective. So if I have a year or two to watch someone, I can start to understand how they think and how they formulate and make decisions. And it only comes through for me, because of my ADHD, this obsessive devotion. You know, this obsessive devotion to only listening to one person because, like, if I try and listen to five different people at the same time on the same subject, I'm going to get five different perspectives on it. Like, it's less efficient. So, for example, you know, when learning sales, I only listen to, like, Jordan Belford. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't really understand how other people sell other than Jordan Belford. Because in my eyes, and and based on, you know, let's just say data, Jordan Belford is, hands down, the number one, one one-to-one salesperson. When it comes to selling one-on-one, he is the best. When it comes to selling online, like one-to-many, Russell Brunson is the best. No one can sell like Russell Brunson on the internet. Like, it's just, he is the number one internet marketer. You know what I mean? Like, it's always debatable, but I don't really care what other people like that's my opinion and many people hold that opinion like do you understand like there are many great sales people out there and potentially there's sales people who outperform Jordan Belfort and Russell Brunson but I don't care like to me they're at a high enough level and they're devoted so much energy and time to their craft that I'm willing to devote years to understand their perspective, to, to gain their knowledge and, and learn all of, like listen to their stories and have them explain everything. And the funny thing was, when learning sales from Jordan Belford, like his sales course, I listened to it on repeat like eight to ten times like thousands of hours of just listening to the same content. You know what I mean? Listening to his audiobooks. Like I've listened to all of his audiobooks multiple times because like Way of the Wolf is is his sales process. Straight line sales and persuasion. So if you ever want to learn it, go get Way of the Wolf and, and literally you will understand if you read it 
Now, I'm not saying read it once and you understand. No, read it 10 to 20 times. Just read it once, read it again, read it again, read it again, read it again. Just dedicate one year to reading it 20 times. Or if you're like me and you like audio books, listen to it 20 times. Like, that's the thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's not about, you know, trying to figure out all these different, you know, trying to find every piece of information. No, just find something that's effective and then obsess over it. That is literally how I've achieved anything in my life. But it's like, you know, to me, when I think about that, so for example, let's take YouTube. Like, my goal is, is to build my, you know, my, um, I don't know, it's like a TV network. That's what I'm going to build. I'm building my own TV network, like ABC, like Fox, like whatever. And the thing is, is for me to achieve that, I know that it is going to take me like not a thousand but it's going to take me about five thousand videos uploaded before i achieve my initial goals so currently i'm almost at two thousand videos and that's after three months of uploading like you've got to understand to beat me you have to be able to do a relentless amount of work an inhuman amount of work because within 12 months I will have succeeded in my goal of over 5,000 videos uploaded like that's the thing like I you know I don't mind sucking at something but you will never outwork me because I will always do more actions because that's the only way I know how to succeed by doing thousands of, upon thousands of actions like when I worked in property sales like I would do a hundred between 100 and 200 calls every day like because like if I did that the end result was I would always meet my my sales targets, my sales goals. So like, I only know how to outwork. You know what I mean? Like, that's all it comes down to is thousands upon thousands of actions. Because by the time I've done a couple of thousand actions, like my quality of how I perform is typically very high in terms of my level of understanding is typically very high so you know that's just one thing I accept is for me whenever I'm doing something like for example there are some YouTube channels that have 46 videos and they've got like 530,000 followers and subscribers and they've got millions of views like I've got like 1900 videos and I've got like 11,000 views like I don't mind do you, do you sort of get it like if you can like you can outperform me with less, less actions but the thing is at, at a point in time the amount of work that I do will will like basically catch up to me in the context of like pretty much like I don't want to be the the best public speaker no I'm gonna do so much work that there will only be me in the algorithm so when I'm you know my five-year goal is 20,000 videos to have 20,000 unique videos on, on YouTube do you get it like you know like I'm not going to copy anyone else I don't care if it takes me 10,000 videos until I reach you know my first milestone of success like there is only forward 
there is only, you know, work. Like, that's it. That's all I know. So it's like... It, it's so funny because, like, that's what comforts me in life is just knowing that I have the, the willingness to do 10, 20,000 actions. I'm okay with it. Like, it's not exhausting for me. And that's an important thing to understand with self-belief is that, you know, and self-confidence and self-worth is it's sort of like we, we build that by the willingness to do the work that we need to do. So, for example, like if you're someone who, let's say you are, you know, doing YouTube and making content, like maybe you want to make like the highest quality content, you know what I mean? And you're willing to put in, you know, 80 hours into each video. Like, like every, like it, there's no one way, like, like working hard and taking actions like it's however you want to do it like I just see it as single actions like if I can do more at lower quality like it doesn't really matter like I don't want to have to do more at the highest quality because that would be extremely exhausting that's why I don't really care too much about the quality of my videos in the context of like I'm not sitting there cutting it so everything is perfect I don't mind it sucking it's okay I'd rather people see me as someone who sucks than me have to spend 80 hours trying to cut and make these videos perfect fuck that would be exhausting so it's sort of like, that's what I've realized in anything when I'm trying to succeed in anything, is that it's always that, that false belief that, you know, it's going to be easier than it is, that I don't have to do all the work. And that's sort of what I have to internally fight against and remind myself is that I have to be okay doing thousands upon thousands of more actions than other people to get the same results and if I'm willing to do that like success is always guaranteed like trust me there will only be me in the algorithm so like it's just how it will be like I don't have to be good I don't have to try I don't have to, you know, copy other people. Like, it's just the sheer, the sheer amount of work that I will do will result in the result that I want. Like, it guarantees the result that I want. So, like, you know, and everyone is unique in this aspect that, like, we all see life differently. So, for example, like I said, some people see life life as, as making things perfect and sort of becoming the most proficient at, you know, at all the different aspects, whereas other people just see it as, if I can do more work, you know, I'll, I'll get the results. So it's sort of like, you, like becoming your authentic self is figuring out like what feels natural and, and right for you. For me personally in life, feels natural that I should have to work, you know, 10 to 15 times harder than another person to succeed and to get what I want. Like, that feels natural to me. What doesn't feel natural to me is that I should care what other people think about the quality of my work. I don't care. If you think I, I sound like a dick and I suck, okay, you're probably right. But I'll remind you, like trying to impress the girl at the wakeboard cable park, 
it's only a matter of time before I understand. And once I understand, then I become the best. Like, that's the thing. Like, it just takes me thousands of pounds, thousands of actions to collect that data. Because I like to correlate large amounts of data so that I can spot and identify trends because that's where my competitive advantage is. I'm very good at identifying trends in data and being able to use data to understand audiences and to understand people. So like, you know, in sales, when I was working in property, because I was doing, you know, three to 6,000 calls, or I was doing about 9,000 calls per quarter, roughly. So like, because I was having so many conversations, like when I would look at data sets or at sort of databases of leads or of potential leads, I would be able to spot and identify trends very quickly in like in the in the clients. So for example, if over the past week I had spoken to, you know, a couple of FIFO miners, let's say 20 or 30 of them, well then I can extrapolate that and say, well, there's a likelihood that there's going to be a lot more and I can take the, the common problems that these people I've spoken to are facing and I can use that to provoke and sort of, um, like, like to to basically provoke other FIFO miners to respond to me and to, to become attracted to me. So to reach out to me. And let's just say the, the strategy had a very high success rate in terms of being able to create unique, you know, con not content, but sales emails that were highly targeted at specific groups of people that I knew were in the database based on statistics. So then once I was able to do it for the miners, well then, hey, I had talked to some nurses. So we did it for nurses. I had talked to some truck drivers. So let's do it for truck drivers. Let's do it for builders. Do you sort of get it? Like once I get that understanding and I spot that gap, then I can use it along everything. And that's what's sort of funny for me is because like that's just how it like that's just how it works for me. You know what I mean? Like it just like once I collect enough data of doing enough actions, like I just understand. It just becomes a part of me. So it's like, for example, working out. When I was doing like bodybuilding, now let's just state this, like I wasn't an amateur bodybuilder, I wasn't that, like I just wanted to get girls. So I just cared about bodybuilding in the sense of body sculpting and muscle development, okay? Like I didn't care about competing and trying to be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, I just cared about being ripped and being attractive to girls. But basically, I used to train for two to three hours a day in high intensity training. So doing high intensity cardio, then doing high intensity weight training, and then doing circuit training. And after doing that for, you know, like a year, like my understanding, because I had done so many actions and I had, you know, worked on building muscle, losing muscle, on, you know, changing my body shape, because I found it really fun to, to work really hard and build muscle, and then go put a bunch of fat on, and then work it back off. Like, I, I thought that was fun, but it's also, you know, bulky. I was trying to get bigger, to a point. But it's like, because I had done so much, I now have such an understanding that, when I work out, I know the max, like the most efficient way to work out for my body. Do you know what I mean? Like, 
if I gave you my gym routine, like it would work for you highly effectively, but it's like, I've designed it for me. So like, you know, you would have to figure it out for yourself in terms of, you know, molding it to what it needs to be so that you can, you know, succeed comfortably within yourself. You know what I mean? Because for example, to the majority of people training between two to three hours a day is not a fun time. But when I say high intensity, I mean pouring sweat. Because the thing was, what I realized is when I can get into that state of being like sprinting as far as you can and, and sort of having the sweat pour out of you, what happens to me is I become a little bit psychotic to where I shift up into a heightened state. So when I put myself under extreme physical pressure and basically, you know, do high intensity workouts, I sort of, I become a bit crazy in the sense that like pushing myself doesn't affect me. Like I'm able to, like I'm in this state of like fight or flight, like survival. You know what I mean? So like pushing myself to the limits isn't that difficult. Do you, do you sort of get what I mean? Like when I'm in a relaxed state, working out is very difficult because I'm not really in the mood. It's, you know, uncomfortable lifting the weights, you know, they're heavy. But when I'm in a psychotic state, you know, I don't mind throwing weight around. Like it's enjoyable. Like I'm, I'm jacked up. I'm ready to go. So like, yeah, for the majority of people, if they tried to work out like, like I worked out, like they wouldn't be having a good time. I was, you know, when I was highly passionate about working out and bodybuilding and all of that, I, I did my fitness course and I was going to become a personal trainer and I got one client. And I realised training other people wasn't for me because other people are fucking pussies. They don't want to do the work. Like when I say run until you're about to collapse, like I mean run until you're physically about to collapse. When I say push the weight that you can handle until your arms give out, until your legs give out, like that's what I mean. Like I'm not saying like do what you think a good job is. No, I mean, push yourself to the point of breaking. Like, like I am that extreme. Like, when I was younger, I, you know, David Boggins, you know, while he was around, like, he wasn't really, like, I didn't know who he was, but how he trained, you know, in no way, shape, or form did I train to his level, okay? But I had a lot of the same principles of pushing yourself to your absolute limits. Because what I realized is if every day I push myself to the breaking point, to the point where I collapse, like what happens is the next day I come back, I can push a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further. And it's not that like I'm moving in you know, meters, you know, like feet and meters every day. No, I'm moving in millimeters and inches. Like, that's the thing. That's how I win. I don't seek to win big. Like, I win with a thousand small steps. A thousand incremental gains. So it's like, that's what's so funny. Is, like... You know, I tried to train this fella because he wanted to go to the military. He did go to the military. But, like, he just... Like, I could see it. He wasn't pushing himself. And it just, like, I wanted, like, I wanted to attack him. So he understood what I meant by, like... If I say run until you collapse, like, run as if I'm coming behind you and I'm going to try and kill you. You know what I mean? Like... If you want to quit, that's okay, but I'm going to start attacking you. And that's why I'm, I didn't become a personal trainer. It's just like that environment, like 
Like, for example, I'll give you an example. When I used to get to the point of breaking, I realized that the more pain I was in, the less exhausted I felt. So the more adrenaline I had pumping, the less exhausted I felt. So I would hit myself, whoops, I hit the, the thing. But like basically, I would be smacking my chest and screaming so that I could push a couple of hundred more meters. Like that's the thing. You know what I mean? I'd be slapping myself in the face so that I could push because like as soon as I slapped myself in the face, my whole attention went to that. But pain makes me angry. And when I get angry, like I become psychotic. So it's like the angrier I could make myself when training, the further and harder I could push my body physically. And it's so funny because one of my mates when we were training, and we were doing like some sort of like CrossFit stuff, and we were doing like circuit training, and we are doing sprints. And like, I, like I got bad asthma. So for me, when I, when I run, like I'll start wheezing and coughing, but I don't care. Like I'm running. Like I don't care if I collapse in the process. So like to get around this, I would be hitting myself while I was running and sort of becoming like animalistic. Because like that's how I knew how to take myself to the next level physically was I had to become like, like I had to revert back to the, the level of instinct. You know what I mean? To where I'm running through. But the other thing was, is I used to use visualization to, um, to really push myself far. And what, what happened was, is, you know, I'd be, I'd be, how I used to do it with my visualization, for example, is because I was training for the military, okay, I used to use one scenario that, you, that never let me down, never failed. And that was that there was a drill instructor next to me, and I would be talking to myself as that drill instructor. Basically, the way the vision goes is my best mate just got shot. He is mortally wounded and about to die. I have one choice, okay? And that choice is to run, okay? So basically, I've got to pick him up, put him on my back, so I visualized having my best mate on my back, the drill instructor next to me screaming at me, if you stop, he is dead. And that's what I used to do. So I used to create this belief that the second I stopped pushing meant my best friend was guaranteed to die. Because unfortunately, in combat, that is typically a likely scenario that happens. That if you're out on patrol and your friend is wounded, like, you have to run to get into a medevac. And if you don't do that, like, he will die. You know what I mean? So it's sort of like, yeah, that's the only way I knew how to push myself further than I'd ever been was to give myself no choice but to push further than I'd ever been. But, alright, well, I'm going to get some fuel and I'll stop this one here, but you guys have an amazing day. Thanks so much. Bye.